Good morning, Dina Community Church. Are there, um, are there any former campers or camp counselors in the room that just can't sing that last song without the camp version of that song? Is that, is that like rolling through your head? It's like if you've ever done youth group stuff, it, there's just a really fun version of that song. So uh, we're going to spend time uh, in God's word together today because we need it and because we need him. And so would you, uh, would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you this morning, and uh, Father, we need you. Um, Father, sometimes we don't, even, we don't even know it, but Father, we desperately need you. I need you. So, Father, pray that you'd be honored, you'd be blessed this morning. Pray that you'd be glorified. Pray that you would be the only one glorified. Pray that you would do a work amongst your people to honor yourself and to equip us for greater worship, for, for greater purpose. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about your walk, your journey of faith. And I want you to think about a time when you were deeply impacted by God. When He revealed Himself powerfully, powerfully to you and it was one of those moments where you thought, he is faithful. He'll always be faithful for me. Can you think of a moment? Do you have one in mind? Now I'm guessing if we survey the room, a lot of us, those moments occurred during very, very difficult times. Is there an amen in the room? That a lot of times it was when life was really hard, when I was at the end of myself, when God most powerfully revealed himself to me. In fact, I'll give an example. A few months ago, I had the privilege to preach and I shared a story about uh, uh, 2016. We had taken a mission trip to Querétaro, Mexico. We had gone down there and one night we were out doing evangelism and actually my sweet daughter, Brookie, is here. So we were doing evangelism and she was not feeling well with stomach pains and, and we just thought, well, it's Mexico, we've eaten something. But it was more than that, it got worse than that. And so I was out with the teens and Jennifer got hold of our leader and said, I, I, think, this is, I think this is something, we need to go. We need to go to the ER. So we went to an ER in the middle of the night and they ran a bunch of tests and and uh, they came out and they said, your, your daughter has a tumor on her ovary that has burst and we're gonna have to do emergency surgery. And oh man, it's one of those moments, you know. And I told that surgeon, I said, you know, this is our princess, please take care of her. So we prayed through the night, she came through the surgery and uh, you know what, the surgery was successful, she recovered, we returned home in a couple of days. And what I found out on the tail end of that is that that particular surgery was the exact specialty of that surgeon. That's what he was renowned for. And then I found out that he rotated hospitals and he was in that particular hospital once a month. So what did that teach me about God? that he was present in just my very worst fear. That God is sovereign even over surgical rotations in Mexico. And that I can trust him. Now, could God have taught me those lessons in less traumatic circumstances? Or maybe the question, do I wish sometimes that God would teach those lessons in less traumatic circumstances? Maybe. But you know what? I don't know if I learn them the same way. Because if you ask me today, seven years later, will I ever, 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 ever for what, forget what God did for me in the middle of the night in a hospital in Mexico? My answer is no, I will never forget that. It's a bedrock moment of God's sovereignty for me in my life. God uses storms to reveal himself and grow our faith. And that's what the passage is about this morning. 
So let's look at the outline since uh, last week we were in 1 Peter. Let's just, especially if there's any visitors in the room, let's try to give ourselves context. So we are in Jesus' Galilean ministry, which is the majority of the gospel. And we are in the third stage of the Galilean ministry. This is when Christ is traveling through Galilee. He's teaching. He's teaching in parables. He's uh, preaching in synagogues. And he's performing miracles. Basically, he's revealing and validating that he really is the, the son of God. But you're starting to see opposition arise. The religious leaders, uh, they don't like him. And you're starting to see the people misunderstand him. They want an earthly king. And that's not why Christ came. <clears throat> and so you begin to see a withdrawal. And it's during this time of withdrawal when Christ begins to focus on his disciples. Ultimately, those that he's going to commission right to take the good news to the ends of the earth it's going to be the foundation of the of the church so two weeks ago when when chris taught he taught about the feeding of the five thousand and that was a miracle performed through the disciples but it was in front of thousands and yet today what we're going to study is this is an actual miracle that had an audience of the disciples only this was for them for an opportunity for them to grow in their faith so just a quick sermon preview as we walk through the text, we're going to see in verses 22 through 26 that a storm is going to arise. We're going to see Christ is comfort. We're going to see Peter's faith, and then we're going to see Peter's fall. We're going to watch the disciples worship and exclaim him to be the Son of God. And then we're going to look at some amazing examples or steps of faith from the Galileans. And then we're going to look at a couple of life applications. And I don't know how John doesn't get dry mouth up here. It boggles my mind. I drink a gallon. Carrie does as well. We're both, it's, it's just. All right, so let's, let's get into the text and let's look at verse 22. <clears throat> Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. So this is directly following the feeding of the 5,000. He compels the disciples to go ahead of him. And he disperses the crowd. And actually, three of the four Gospels give the account of this. And you'll see some added insight in the Gospel account of John and John 6.15. It says, So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. That there was this movement, this swell of enthusiasm that Christ needed to be king now, and that was not his mission and not his purpose. And so he sends the disciples away, and he disperses the crowd. And then we see in verse 23, in the beginning of 24, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. So this is a consistent theme. Throughout the gospel, you'll see Christ remove himself in solitude and spend time with the Father. Now this could be a sermon within a sermon, but if Christ needed to spend time with the Father, how much more do we? And do we take the time, do we make it a priority to go and spend time in solitude with our Savior? And then in verse 24, it says, But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And you can see, actually, that's quite small. So if you're in the back of the room, you may not be able to see this. But that is a map uh, taken from a commentator where you see on the east side the feeding of the 5,000. He sent them ahead of the boat. John says they rode about three to five miles. So they're somewhere in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. That's obviously an approximation of the miracle location, but they're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And there arose a, a violent storm. And if you think about it, these are, majority of these are fishermen, right? And, and so they, they spend a lot of time on the water. And this is not just any storm, right? Because this is their sea. And this is such a violent storm that they were terrified. They were utterly terrified. Verses 25, And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. This would typically be 3 to 6 a.m. It's the middle of the night. And what this would indicate is that Christ likely spent 8 to 10 hours with the Father on that mountain. So what does that mean the disciples were doing for eight to 10 hours? Those disciples were on the sea in a storm fighting for their lives for eight to 10 hours. 
It means they were utterly exhausted. Then verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. So again, imagine the winds raging. It's the middle of the night. It's dark. They're absolutely exhausted and they begin to see something take shape through the storm. And then they begin to see that this something is on the water, something they've never, ever seen before. And one of the things that I read is that there were just a lot of superstitions at this time among sailors and fishermen that if anyone died at sea, the superstition was is they would continue to haunt other sailors and fishermen on that water. So these, these fishermen probably grew up with these superstitions, right? These horror stories of the night. And here they see something coming to them and they're absolutely terrified. So I want you to take just a moment and I want you to think about the disciples. They're separated from Christ and they have been for hours. They're a long distance from shore. They're battling a violent storm, an unusual storm, a terrifying storm, and they have been for hours. It's in the middle of the night and they're terrified. And then stop and step back and ask yourself the question, why? If Jesus really loves these disciples, why would he allow such a storm to arise? Why would he permit or prescribe a storm that would scare even the best of sailors? Why would he stay away from them so long? Why would he let the storm last for eight to ten hours before he approached them? And we often ask these questions of ourselves as well, right? Why does God allow storms in our life for so long that are terrifying? And why do we seem to be separated from him at times? And the reason the reason for the storm is that Jesus loved them. And Jesus wanted to teach them and he wanted to reveal truths about himself in such a powerful and impactful way that these were the circumstances by which they would be impacted forever. These are the circumstances why they would see him in this light and they would never be the same. So it's in this state that Jesus is ready to teach and it's in this state that they're actually ready to learn. And then Christ speaks. And look at the words, verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. So before we move on from that text, read that again. Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now notice at this point, Jesus tells them there is absolutely no reason to be afraid, and yet, has the storm changed at all? Are the waves still raging? Is the wind still screaming? Are they practically any safer from the circumstances that they were in? And yet Jesus says, you no longer have any reason to be afraid. Why? Why would Jesus' words change everything? Three reasons. Number one, Jesus is present. He's there. He's with them. And not only is Jesus present, but he loves them. Look at the words. Take courage. Literally in Greek, that means be of good cheer. What an odd statement at an odd moment. Be of good cheer. Right? Do not be afraid. You see this common refrain from the words of Christ to his disciples throughout Matthew's gospel. You can see multiple references, exactly those words. Don't be afraid. I know you're afraid, but there's no reason to be afraid. 
Why? Because he's God. The Greek is actually a weird grammar structure, but it literally means I am. A reference, an exodus, to God's name for himself. Christ saying, I'm God. I'm sovereign over creation. I'm sovereign over the storm. I'm sovereign over your lives. I'm sovereign over your fear. So in the context of wind screaming and waves bashing against the boat, what do they need to hear to not be afraid anymore? They need to know that Jesus is right there with them, that Jesus loves them, and that Jesus is in control of these circumstances. And with that knowledge, then Christ's admonition is absolutely true. There's just absolutely no reason to be afraid any longer. Now we're going to go to Peter's reaction, and, and we're going to see one of the most awesome examples and steps of faith, because I think a lot of times when this text is looked at, we tend to look at the doubt of Peter. But before you get to the doubt of Peter, it's absolutely astounding. Peter's reaction, and it wasn't the reaction of all the other disciples. Peter uniquely demonstrates faith, and he uniquely demonstrates impetuousness, often at the same time, right? That's the nature of Peter. He's such a relatable person to us. So look at 28 and 29. It says, Peter said to them, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water, and he came towards Jesus. Now, it's interesting. Matthew is the only gospel writer that chose to in include this account in his gospel. So Peter, in, 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 hearing the exhortation of Christ, I'm here, be strong, it is I. The natural request would be what? Turn the storm off. I mean, the natural request that we often feel, if we're honest, when life starts getting hard, right? The immediate reaction is, God, just please stop the storm, right? It's just the natural inclination, but that's not Peter's response. Like the words of Christ and seeing Christ in that miracle in that moment, he just wanted to respond in faith. And he does it in this amazing way because the storm is still raging when he gets out of the boat. So, has anybody skydived or has anybody bungee jumped? There is no small first step, amen? <laughs> right? I mean, your first step is, is in for a penny, in for a pound. That's the first step out of the boat. So again, don't, don't fictionalize this historical account. This is a man, terrified and exhausted, who saw Christ and heard Christ, and he responds in faith. And he gets out of the boat, and he starts walking on water. You imagine what's going on in his head. Now flip and see it through the eyes of Christ. How much pleasure do you think it gave Christ to look at Peter's faith in that moment and say, you see me. Like you, you believe me. Your behavior is in line with your faith and you're acting on that faith. Can you imagine the pleasure that Jesus saw in that moment? And then Peter is just like us. And you look at verse 30. But seeing the winds, he became frightened. He takes his eyes off of Jesus. He puts his eyes on the storm. He puts his eyes on his troubles. And he begins to sink. And beginning to sink, he cried out and said, Lord, save me. And of course, this request is maybe less out of a response of just sheer faith and maybe a little bit of desperation. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. Christ, please save me. But isn't this our experience as well? Think back to some of those moments that you thought of. Think back to a storm. Maybe a storm that you're in. Maybe this isn't a past tense. And think back to 
you wake up, you spend time in prayer, and you walk into that day saying, God, I'm going to trust you with this door. And then I'll to give me as an example, give me a half hour. And those fears will start arising in, in my heart. Right? It's not a one-time singular decision. Oh, here's a storm. Okay, I'm going to put this in the trust bucket. I'm good. <laughs> that may be some people's experience, but that's not the normative experience. The normative experience is that cycling of fear, that cycling of anxiety, right? Is 10 minutes ago, I saw Jesus as sovereign over this, and now I'm scared. So Peter is, he's just like us, right? He, he saw Christ, he acted on it, he, he started looking at the storm, and then he realized without Christ, he's in trouble. So verse 31, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and he took hold of him and he said to him, if you have little faith, why did you doubt? The root issue with Peter at this moment isn't the storm. It's not the source of danger, right? Christ already clarified that. It's a lack of faith. It's putting his eyes back on the trouble, the danger, instead of Christ. Now, one thing that just hit me in looking at this is you see the text that says, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand. And if we're honest, that's the way we want it to happen in our story is as soon as we start feeling pain, as soon as we start feeling trauma, as soon as we start feeling hurt and ache and despair, we want Jesus to immediately step in, right? Immediately. And then we often struggle and we ask ourselves, why is he waiting so long? Does he see the pain? Does he see the despair? Does he, does he care about these things, right? And the reality is, and this is true of me, and I think it's true of you, is we don't judge very well when we're actually at the end of ourselves. Because we presume at the immediate moment of pain, we're there. And the reality is we're not there. How do we know when we're there? Because God stepped in. I think it's a trust thing. I think it's a faith thing. If I'm in a storm, if I'm in pain, and it's persisting, I trust that God knows when I'm at the end of myself. And I trust that at the moment when he needs to step in, he will step in. And by the way, that's been my experience. Rarely early, never late. But that's a trust thing, and it's, it's hard. So now we move to really what is the apex of the text. It's verses 32 and 33. When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped Him, saying, You are certainly God's Son. So Jesus not only has the power to walk on water, to empower others to walk on water, to save Peter from sinking, but he demonstrates in this moment he's actually got sovereignty over the storm itself. And this is the moment, right? This is the author's intent. This is, they see Jesus and they make an exclamation about him, a proclamation in their progressive understanding of who Christ is. It's the first time. It's the first time in the gospel that they say, surely you are God's son. This moment taught them something. It revealed something. The storm curated a moment for them to see and experience something, and then they proclaim it. And then they worship. And that's why they exist. And that's why you and I exist. And the storms that drive us to a place of authentic, sincere, pure, heart-overwhelmed worship, that's, that's when we're at our highest calling. That's when we are exactly who God redeemed us and, and saved us to be. And now the storm is calmed. They make the proclamation and they worship. But our text doesn't stop there, which is really interesting, 
right? We're actually going to move into verses 34 through 36. And there's, there's a little bit of a juxtaposition because you see the disciples terrified. You see Peter's doubt. And now they're going to land in Gennesaret. And thank you, Antonia, for telling me how to pronounce that because I think I was mispronouncing it all week. And then you said that, and I know Chris looked it up. And uh, so thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, and, and what you're going to see amongst the Galileans is you're going to see tremendous steps of faith. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word into all the surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched it were cured. So look at, at some of the steps of faith, right? So number one... They had heard of Christ. They had heard of Jesus. They had heard that he performed miracles and they sent word into the surrounding area. Now, today that's a tweet or an email, right? But that, that's not what happened, right? To send word into the surrounding area, that means people left what they were doing and they walked and they went door to door telling people that Jesus is here. That's a tremendous act of faith. <clears throat> Think about the sick and their families. They responded by hearing Jesus and they came to see him. How easy would that trip have been? How easy would it be to, to bring the lame, to bring the paralyzed, to bring the sick to Jesus? There's nothing convenient about that. It's a tremendous step of faith. <clears throat> and then upon seeing Jesus, they took the step of faith to, to touch his cloak, even just to touch his cloak, believing even that could heal him. It's a tremendous act of faith. And again, when you look at this moment, the disciples had just worshipped. And now they see the people of Galilee responding. And then put yourself through the eyes of Christ again. How pleased is he to arrive and to see the people respond this way. Tremendous act of trust. Tremendous acts of faith. It really is another example of how God uses difficult circumstances for His glory. And it made me think of a text in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. And it says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he would be born blind. And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Why hardships? Why sickness? Why storms? Why pain? Why tragedy? So that the works of God might be displayed in him. So two life applications that, that God just put on my heart um, as I've been studying this text. And the first one is we need storms. We don't like them, but we need them. Because if I'm never scared and if I'm never weak and if I generally have things in control, Guess what? I won't actually depend on God. And if I don't actually depend on God, I'll never get to discover just how faithful and good He is. And if I don't personally, profoundly experience how good and sovereign God is, then I won't worship. Right? So we need these storms, and they're hard. It made me think of another text in 2 Corinthians 12, and think of the text, the thorn on the flesh, right? To keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn of the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Because when I am weak, I am strong. I see God's strength best and clearest 
when I can't stand on my own. And as much as I don't ever want to be in that place, I look back and they really are the most profound, sweetest moments of my life in my walk with Christ. They're just hard. Second application that I thought about really goes back to Peter and that moment where he's looking at Christ and then he looks at the storm and just how much I think we all relate to exactly that, that behavior. Peter's you and Peter is me. So I started thinking, what does that actually look like? And I thought of three practical examples that, that maybe you've dealt with all three, maybe you've dealt with one of the three, but something that we could relate to and where our mind goes when we're focused on the storm versus when we're focused on Jesus. What about anxiety? If you'd asked me in my 20s if I struggled with anxiety or if I would ever struggle with anxiety, I think I would have give a, given a fairly flippant no. Like, why would you? <laughs> and the older I get, the fewer things I worry about. But the things that I worry about, I worry about them so much more than I ever did. And the reality is, anxiety is a tremendous burden for me. This is just a reality that I walk in. And so where are the cycles in my head? When I'm focused on the storm, nobody will understand my fear. Nobody has anxiety like I do. I just have to fight this battle alone. Right? If what I need to happen doesn't happen, the result will be catastrophic. God has to come through in this prescribed way or I can't even see beyond that. I can only be truly happy and content if this, whatever this is at the moment, does or does not happen. That's the storm. What does it look like to look at Jesus in the storm? God knows my fear. He knows my anxiety. And He deeply loves me. Deeply loves me. Exactly as I am. God is present with me regardless of what does or doesn't happen. It's not the outcome that determines presence. He's there. The outcome is unknown, but His presence is not. And God is sovereign over even these circumstances. There's nothing at play here that is a variable to a good and sovereign God. What about disappointment? You ever been disappointed? You ever had something that you just so expected, so anticipated, so worked for, so needed to happen, and then expectations weren't met and you find yourself just wrestling with God? So what does that storm look like? I thought life would be so much different. It can really hit you in your 40s and 50s, by the way. I don't see how God's purposes could be served in this. I just don't see how any good can, can come from this. Does God truly care about my sadness? We don't voice that, but we thought it. Does God really, really care about how hard this hurts right now? That's the storm. What does it feel like? What does it look like to look at Jesus? God knows my disappointment. And it's okay. He loves me. I can even say to God, I'm disappointed, and He loves me. It's okay. That's why Psalms is so amazing, because David is so honest. Known as a man after God's own heart. We can have honest conversations with God. It's okay. He loves you. God is present with me regardless of what does or doesn't happen. My disappointment may remain. This thing that I wanted so badly may not happen. It's okay. God is sovereign over even this outcome. God's will be done. Right? God's will be done. And for those that are married, and uh, typically marriages have seasons, and there are seasons of uh, uh, bliss and ease. And there are seasons of challenge and misunderstanding. And sometimes those seasons can be harder than we imagine. So if you're in a storm of marriage, if it's just hard, what does that look like to stare at the storm? He or she will never change. 
Or maybe you're even looking at yourself. And you're saying, I can't ever change. I'll always be this broken. I can't ever see myself being happy with this person. It's beyond God's capability that He could bring joy into this marriage. And I feel so alone. But what does it look like to look at Jesus in that difficult marriage? God knows everything about your marriage. And He loves you. He loves you. God is present in the difficult season of marriage, regardless whether it gets easier tomorrow or not. He's there. He's with you. And He's sovereign over these circumstances. God redeems marriages every day. There are redeemed marriages in this room. God is in the business of doing miracles. God's will be done. God, I submit to Your will. It's the hardest prayer in the world, by the way. Thy will be done. But that prayer is worship. That prayer is submission. So, in conclusion, I just confess this, this sermon was for me. Um, I was supposed to preach last week. We were not going to take an excursion into 1 Peter. And I got sick a week ago Wednesday. And I just continued to get worse. And uh, I had let Chris know a few days in advance, hey, I'm, I'm trending poorly. But I just, it's a hard thing for me to ask for help. And so there I am Saturday and I feel awful and I'm trying to button up a sermon and I'm just feeling it. And I'm like, it became not a physical thing. It became a psychological thing. It became a tremendously anxious moment for me to pick up the phone and call Chris and say, would you mind stepping in tomorrow? I just really wrestled with it. I wrestled with what faithful is. And I don't want to let anybody down. And so it was a storm. And then I just had to, I just had to say, you know what, God, it's not about me. I mean, so I called Chris. Chris was such a blessing. Um, by the way, when you, to John's point, when you communicate an elder candidate and the crowd reacts like that, that's <laughs> really, really, really awesome and affirming. Um, but we're so thankful. And Chris was a huge blessing to me last week. But that wasn't where the storm stopped because I, I continued to not feel very well this week. And then the opportunity came up for me not to preach the sermon. And preaching sermons is just hard on me. This is, it, it brings about a lot of anxiety in me. And there was an out. I didn't, I didn't have to do this storm. <laughs> it sounded really good. <laughs> it sounded really easy. And then I just went back to the text and I'm like, so when have I grown in faith when it was comfortable and convenient? How am I going to worship when it's easy? I just couldn't. And so I just needed to preach this sermon. I needed to, I needed to fight through the storm and for God to uh, help me walk through things as He always does. But I'm guessing that I'm not the only storm participant here today. And so I don't know. I don't know what God said to you from His Word and, and in this moment, but I pray that He did speak to you in a profound way. And if you're caught in those cycles, it's okay. You're not alone. Talk to somebody. We're a church. We're a body of Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus in that storm. But there is a chance that there's somebody here today and you haven't placed your trust in Christ. And it could be a storm that brought you here this morning. It could be desperation that brought you here this morning could be a divine moment. This could be God having this sermon for you to communicate to you how much He loves you and how He's present and how He's faithful. And if that's you this morning, it's the easiest prayer in the world. It's something like, I'm a sinner. I've made a mess of my life. And I cannot save myself. And I'm just exhausted trying. I believe that Christ is the Son of God. I believe He lived. I believe He died. I believe He rose again. And I accept Him as my Savior. And this is my prayer of faith. That is the simplest of prayer and the most profound of transitions and outcomes. Because the Bible would say that you were, in that moment, redeemed and adopted as a child of God. 
And your journey of faith starts now. And if that's you, maybe this was all for you. And I pray that you would pray that prayer. So if y'all would pray with me. So Father God, come before you this morning. And um, you're the God of the storm. You love us. You're present and you're sovereign. Father, I pray you would remind us of those truths for the rest of our days. And Father, help us to not run from the storms all the time. But help us to sit, to learn, to grow, and to worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.